Breathing's kind of important. It's just one of the reasons why chokeholds should be banned. But let's talk about some populations who've adapted to low oxygen conditions and how they've solved that problem. Let's start talking about hypoxia and high altitude. So here we're talking about high altitude environments, which have a couple uh, different difficulties. First, there's just huge daily temperature swings. Um, it's probably not actually that warm during the day, but at night it drops really, really cold. Um, they also tend to be fairly arid. There's not much water. Um, there's a lot of UV radiation because the higher you go, there's actually less atmosphere um, protecting you. So more UV radiation gets in. Um, the soil doesn't tend to be very good. Um, the terrain is really rough. And all of these put together, there's just like not many things to eat. But probably the hardest challenge of a high altitude environment is hypoxia. Hypoxia means there are it's low oxygen conditions. And this is important because we need it to breathe. Oxygen is, you can find see it right there, it is one of the essential things for aerobic respiration. This is the primary mode of respiration for most of our most of our cells. I highly recommend you take a molecular biology course. You will learn much more about this in detail. But if you have food or glu mainly glucose and oxygen, then you can do take advantage of the both the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain um, to get energy. Of course, uh, carbon dioxide and water are, are byproducts of this, but the main thing is we wanna get that ATP so we can um, use that to carry out pretty much all of the processes of our cells. Um, the thing, though, is there's a couple places in the world which have high altitude. Um, so that three places that have the highest altitude are the Himalayas, the Andes, and then the Ethiopian highlands. Um, for this lecture, we're primarily going to focus on the Himalayas and the Andes. Um, so anybody, if you encounter a situation where there is lower than normal oxygen, there's a couple things that might happen. Um, probably you're going to have increased ventilation, so you're going to breathe faster and deeper. Of course, um, one of the risks here is you at, might go into hyperventilation, um, and this is something um, climbers um, need to train themselves out of if they're going to um, climb any particularly high mountains. Um, you might also see more active capillaries in your lungs. So if there's reduced oxygen, your lungs might try to make, um, you know, you utilize more of the surface area in your lungs to be more likely to uptake as much oxygen as possible. Um, you might also see increased blood cell counts. So if there are more blood, red blood cells in your blood, you're more likely to um, take up oxygen. Um, you're also going to see increased myoglobin in your muscles so that uh, myoglobin um, contains heme, which stores oxygen. So it's trying to get more um, oxygen to your muscles so you're able to utilize it. Um, but we also see a couple populations which have adaptations um, to deal with these low oxygen conditions. So uh, HIF1 or high hypoxia inducible factor one. This is a gene that helps us regulate our response to hypoxic conditions. And what it does is it helps us switch our metabolism from aerobic metabolism, which needs oxygen, to anaerobic metabolism. So not all of our um, cellular metabol metabolic processes require oxygen, though it is the primary mode for uh, most of the time. Um, and even though we can use anaerobic processes, um, some regions of our brain actually cannot survive with anaerobic metabolism. Um, but we do see this gene is upregulated um, when you're in a hypoxic environment. And what, what's even more in interesting is the Sherpa people from native to the Himalayan region, they actually have a different allele. Um, so let's talk about these native Tibetan populations. Um, they live in uh, in a hypoxic environment, and we see their biology is a little bit altered from the rest of us. So they have a slightly higher ventilation rate than everyone else um, without hyperventilating. Um, we also see that we, they do not have a decreased birth weight, um, even though they're at high altitude. Um, normally, um, people who come from populations which are not adapted to high altitude conditions will have a decrease in birth weight if they give birth at a high altitude condition. So if you're not a native Tibetan, I recommend you try and give birth a little closer to sea level. Um, but they also have modified alleles for um, a couple genes as part of the H1F1 system. So we see Eglin1 and EPAS1, um, they both have modified alleles. 
Um, there's a really interesting paper if you want to um, check it out by Huerta Sanchez, Huerta Sanchez et al., um, where they think that these alleles might have arrived uh, due to intergression with the ancient Denise events. Um, so uh, one plausible scenario for what, what might have happened is that Denise events were living in this area. Um, ancestral Homo sapiens came. Um, we got this EPS-1 allele from them um, to create the Sherpa ancestors. Of course, the Han Chinese are even more recent into the area, and that's where they got both EPS and Eglin-1 from, from the Sherpa ancestors to create modern-day Tibetans. Let's also look at the New World. The Andes are also um, really high altitude mountains. Um, Machu Picchu is a gorgeous site, but you need to be very careful to make sure you prepare before you go visit that site. Um, people in this area, they just have larger hearts and lungs than everyone else. And they also have a slightly higher concentration of red blood cells. So this is how they are, are responding to this environmental condition. What's interesting is this is something called a developmental adaptation. Native Andean people only develop this if they grow up under hypoxia and hypoxic conditions. So if um, someone was from a native Andean population, but they grew up at sea level, they would not demonstrate um, these phenotypes. So can you explain? What populations have adaptations to hypoxic conditions and what are these adaptations?